Yes. Some bright lights there. Heat lamps. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Wes Selke, uh, one of the managing directors and founders of Better Ventures, uh, based over in Oakland. And I have the esteemed privilege uh, this afternoon to be facilitating, moderating this panel of some really awesome people. We've got some serious firepower up here, as I'm sure you saw in the program, uh, some excellent GPs uh, that are working with top-notch uh, VC firms, working at the seed stage in sort of the impact space. Uh, I know each and every one of them quite well, in fact, have co-invested, uh, I think, with everybody on the panel. And uh, actually, Julie was just pointing out that, uh, Brian, uh, all four of us invested in Booknook, yes, and you passed <laughs> no on pressure, Booknook. Brian. Not yet. <laughs> OK, not yet, <laughs> not yet. Next yeah. round. Yeah, that's a typical yeah. venture uh, answer right there. <laughs> not yet, you know. It's the always, always leave it open. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to maybe quickly frame this up before we, we dive into some questions here. But you know, I've been working in the impact space for about a decade. And there has been tremendous evolution of this space uh, since, I, since I joined. Uh, I was working with Good Capital right out of business school in 2007. And we would go out and you know, raise capital for that fund. And re we really made people's heads hurt when we talked about uh, impact investing. They just really didn't understand, you know, shouldn't this be uh, philanthropy? Are you, are you just giving money away? And you know, this space has really evolved over those years. And um, you know, a, a number of us on this panel you know, started off with accelerator programs that, that then sort of evolved into venture funds. And, um, you know, uh, years ago, there was very little early stage capital available in the impact space. And that has really changed quite significantly in the last, you know, call it seven to 10 years. And uh, this panel is a great example of that. So um, I do want to just sort of dive in and maybe allow the four of you to maybe quickly introduce yourselves, your firm, maybe talk briefly about your strategy. Mm -hmm. Want to kick us off, Julie? Yeah, thanks, Wes. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Lean, and I'm the co-founder and managing partner of the Urban Innovation Fund. Uh, we invest in startups transforming our cities, um, and we specifically provide seed capital and regulatory support to entrepreneurs tackling our toughest urban problems with the goal of getting them to be tomorrow's most uh, valued and impactful startups. Um, we also started as an accelerator program initially. My co-founder Clara and I launched an accelerator program called Tummel about four years ago focused on urban ventures. Through the accelerator, we incubated 38 startups working in areas like transportation, energy and water, uh, workforce development. And after the financial um, and impact success of many of those startups, we decided to formalize our investing efforts through the Urban Innovation Fund. Um, and if you are a startup out there tackling an urban problem, I'd love to talk to you after this panel. Great. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Chantal Polson. I am a co-founder and general partner at Reach Capital. We're an early stage fund focusing on companies who are pursuing issues of access and opportunity in education. We're a $53 million fund. Uh, we primarily invest at the seed stage, although we will do some Series A and Series B. We spun out of New Schools Venture Fund. We spun out of New Schools Venture Fund, which is a nonprofit um, that focuses primarily in the K-12 space. So to date, most of our investing has been within K-12, and we're starting to broaden that to both early childhood and post-secondary education. Great. Hi, I'm Tasha Seitz. Uh, I'm with Impact Engine, uh, which is the only non-Bay Area-based fund, actually, yeah. now that I think about it. We're yeah. also um, a black sheep. Um, so we're based in Chicago. Um, we also started life as an acceler accelerator fund for Impact companies. Um, and a few years ago, we sort of made the observation that companies that were coming out of our program um, it was taking them a long time to raise funding. Um, there were a lot of investors they were meeting with who were quite interested in making impact investments but weren't quite ready to pull the trigger on writing a check. Yeah. Um, so we saw an opportunity to launch a fund so that we could invest on behalf of interested investors uh, into impact companies. So our focus is um, software companies that are driving improvements in education, health, resource efficiency and economic empowerment. We invest at the seed and series A stage. Um, and because we have that background as an accelerator, we have an amazing community, um, very, very deep in Chicago in the Midwest, 
uh, that we can put into service uh, of the companies and, and use that community to help and add value to companies in, in a variety of ways. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk cool. about that too. Thanks. Brian. I, I get to that point. Uh, how many entrepreneurs are in the room? Ah. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to get a poll. Uh, I'm Brian Dixon, one of the partners at Caper Capital, and we're a seed stage impact fund in Oakland. And I think the thesis of our fund is how do we help close um, gaps of access and opportunity similar to REACH um, and many folks on this panel, um, especially for low-income communities and communities of color. Um, so anytime we're making an investment in a product, that's kind of the filter we put things through. Um, and as a seed stage fund, we get a chance to work with entrepreneurs in their first round um, or first institutional round of funding. Um, and I've been there six years. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Okay. So I've got about 100 questions <laughs> for you guys and 50 minutes. And definitely want to leave some time at the end here. So we got a show of hands for entrepreneurs. How many uh, VC fund managers or sort of aspiring VC fund managers do we have in the house? Wonderful. Okay. And then LPs, investors in funds. Okay, we'll meet you guys backstage uh, <laughs> afterwards. Okay, we have uh, snacks back there. We'll hang out. Uh, great. So, I, you know, I, I want to, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that goes into kind of seed stage fund strategy. And I've learned a great deal about that in the last seven years, as have my colleagues up on stage. So I think what I'd like to do is sort of ask some questions around uh, fund strategy, uh, a number of things that we'll get to that we talked about before, um, and also want to kind of, so, you know, speaking to an audience of, of VC fund managers as well as entrepreneurs, and we'll get to some questions uh, that really relate to entrepreneurs as well. So, you know, my first question is, you know, do you think of yourself as an impact fund? Uh, that is a, that can be a little bit of a loaded word, the word impact, just like social, uh, you know, it means different things to different people. Uh, depending on whose office you walk into, you know, impact can uh, sink your ship if you're trying to raise money, or it can rise it up. So I'd love to, you know, maybe very quickly, you know, how do you guys think about impact? You talk about yourselves as impact fund. Mm. You want to kick us off? Sure. I'll, I'll, uh, I think they switched me to this. So All right. I'll kick it off. Um, so yes, we are an impact fund. Um, and why? Well, that's the whole reason for why we're, what we're trying to do, right? It's, um, when we're making an investment, we're not only thinking about, is this going to get us the return, uh, 3x return of the fund, but also, how does this actually make a difference? Um, and um, we started rolling out uh, with founders, pretty much creating a social impact deck, um, where the founders, especially at the early stage, a lot is unknown. Um, and a lot is unknown with the business, a lot is unknown with kind of impact. Um, so now we have a deck that we can kind of meet around or speak around. What does this look like? Um, where do you think you'll be in 12 months? Um, and what will the impact be? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was for us one of the game changers. Um, declaring we're an impact fund and actually putting some structure around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Tasha? Well, impact is in our name, so we are very yeah. clearly <laughs> an impact focused True. fund. It's part of our brand. Um, we really do care about it and we're looking for entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. are impact motivated, so that's why mm -hmm. the brand matters. Um, we dig in pretty deep with them. Mm -hmm. um, on impact, we create a separate sort of logic model around each company mm -hmm. uh, that we invest in, in terms of making the link between the product that they are delivering to the market uh, and ultimately the outcomes that we think that product can create. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, it's also important on the LP side as well. So um, part of what we do is provide up investors with opportunities to engage, to mm -hmm. deepen their own mm -hmm. understanding of impact investing. Mm -hmm. um, and so selecting LPs and bringing in investors that are impact motivated mm. is important for us. So yes, it's it's important part of our branding. And, and frankly, we love the entrepreneurs who I call them the closet impact entrepreneurs where they may yes. be doing a, you know, a company in health, they've got some great mainstream technology venture investors. And then we say, hey, we really would like to talk about impact and dig in and construct a logic model. And they're so excited mm. to talk with us about that. And we yeah. love those kinds of entrepreneurs. Great. So yes, we also consider ourselves to be an impact-focused fund. And I think, unfortunately, the word has gotten very diluted. So yep. most funds you're going to talk to today are impact funds. They'll have impact in their branding, impact in their, in their deck. But what does it actually mean? And when, when it comes down to it, I think actions speak a lot louder than words. Mm -hmm. um, so we're impact by the nature of what we're doing in terms of being focused within the education sector. Um, but I think we take it to the next level, both in terms of who we're investing in 
So we like to say that we look for missionaries, not mercenaries, right? So I think it first comes down to that initial screen in terms of the entrepreneurs, are, and are they in it for impact reasons? Are they in it because they're passionate about improving some aspect of the education system? Uh, the next piece is just how we uh, evaluate impact as the uh, company progresses. And so we work with a third party who helps us understand who you're impacting. So Brian talked about low-income communities, communities of color. We look at that in terms of the user base. So we're not going to invest in companies that are only serving like high, high net worth individuals, for example. Um, we also look at the, the use, usage and penetration. So we want to make sure that our companies are not going to schools and ever being used by teachers, right? So we look at impact in terms of the depth of the usage. Um, and then just the satisfaction of those users. And then lastly, obviously, um, the holy grail is just improvement in student outcomes, right? And so because we're so early stage, we might not be able to get to that last aspect, but we'll have some early indicators showing that um, they are making progress towards their in intended impact in terms of student achievement. Awesome. Um, so at the risk of being uh, echoing what many of my panelists have said, we are a market rate driven fund with a specific uh, investment thesis around urban innovation and making our cities a better place to live. For us, we are absolutely impact-driven, mission-driven, world-positive, whatever you, spin you want to put on it. Um, to Tasha's point, I think many of our entrepreneurs would not necessarily self-identify as impact because they worry about the challenges of that word. It is a charged word, and I think to some investors' mind, it does uh, trigger, oh, maybe this is concessionary, maybe you're not focused on market rate returns. I think more and more we're moving to a place where you don't have to be concessionary when you're achieving impact goals, um, but I do understand why some uh, of our entrepreneurs have shied away from it. I think it's true on the LP side too, right? So yeah. you'll, you'll have LPs that'll say, well, I don't want to look at an impact focused fund because maybe they'll have lower returns. So right. like you said, we want to lead with, we are a market rate return driven um, firm, but also, also looking at impact. Yeah, and to that point, actually many of our investors would not necessarily self-identify as impact. I would call many of them impact curious, which is a <laughs> name that actually Rick uh, from Better Ventures came up with. And it refers to many are looking for differentiated investment theses, many are looking for n new types of fund managers that look a little bit different, act a little bit different from the norm, and I think that's a really great trend. Yeah, I think we must have come up with maybe 60 different ways to say that we're impact-driven uh, based on the 60 iterations of our investor deck for our last fund. And uh, I do remember one time uh, Rick and I were shooed out of an institutional LP's office in Chicago because we, we said that we muttered the words mission-driven. And I think the, his response was, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and, uh, you know, clearly they weren't a good fit for the fund. But, uh, yeah, uh, nomenclature is really important. Real quick, one-word answers, do you measure impact? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Oh, look at that. <laughs> All right. All yeses. Okay. Um, when you're evaluating a deal, what is more important to you between the team or the market? And what else do you look for? Maybe, maybe we'll just have a couple of you guys answer because we have a lot of questions to get to here. Tasha, what do you look for? What's more important, uh, team or market? Do I have to? I'm a both and nope. kind of investor. <laughs> I'll go. I mean, I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll, I'll put a stake in the ground. So, okay. <laughs> so for us, it's team. Right. Um, and, and first and foremost, at, especially at the earliest stages. Yep. Um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are driving the company. And if the, it is the right team, they'll figure out the market. And if they're not in the right market, they'll pivot to the right market. So really, it is the team. And can they execute? And do they have a large enough vision? And I could just jump in and add, uh, I completely agree, we also look at team, but a lot of times when people talk about investing in the team, what does that mean? And a lot of times I think in venture capital you see a lot of affirmation bias where you know the same types of faces and names and ages get um, funded over and over. And for us, when we look at team, we really try to place a large uh, stake on execution. So showing that even when you're early stage, you can still have traction, you can demonstrate that you're hungry and scrappy and working really hard and starting to have a lot of market penetration at an early stage. So for us, that's really the most important thing. Well, and I'll just jump in on the team piece because, I mean, the old rule, venture capital rule of thumb is you want an A team in a B market or with a B product rather than a B team with an A on all other counts. Um, but I think, so I think the execution piece is key, but we also do look for entrepreneurs that are tar either targeting large markets or where we see market adjacencies, mm -hmm. because we are trying to drive attractive financial returns mm -hmm. alongside, and there are a lot of companies that have 
you know, great products, you know, maybe even great teams, but if there's not sort of a big market opportunity, it's just mm. hard to grow a big, valuable company in that yep. space. So, yep. and both are important. So you're all early stage investors, um, and you know, sometimes the complaint is often, you know, no one will invest in my company. I'm too early. It's a chicken or the egg. I need the capital to, you know, build the product, uh, but I need the product to raise the capital. Uh, Brian, can you comment quickly on, you know, what do you look for? Say, so we all know sort of team and market are, are really important, but what is it uh, that you see in an entrepreneur and in a team that, in a, that, that you know, signals to you, okay, we're, we're ready to go in here? Yeah, so I think it comes down to the why. Um, mm -hmm. Why is this the problem you want to spend the next five years tackling? Mm -hmm. um, for us, a lot of the entrepreneurs we invest in, um, they have some lived experience mm -hmm. for why they're tackling the problem, whether it be in education, mm -hmm. um, whether it be in health. Um, mm -hmm. We just made an investment in a company called Hustle, and it's scaling text messaging, um, mm -hmm. personalized text messaging. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, why is that important to the founder? And it turns out that his father and his grandfather both worked in politics. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that when he sat around the table um, mm -hmm. as a child growing up, he wanted to solve. Um, and it's something that he wanted to solve for his whole life. Mm -hmm. um, so we're always trying to get at the, the why. We probably asked that question too many times mm -hmm. uh, just to get the real answer. But if you, get, if you ask the question why and you get a, a response that you like, but it's still really, really early. Will you, will you invest, or do you, is there certain traction well, no. <laughs> thresholds that you need to see? That would bring us in. Um, okay. We want to try the product, so okay. that's the first thing. We, w we like to touch the product. So do you not do pre-product? So we do not do pre-product um, at all, so that's okay. one. Um, pre-revenue, we do pre-revenue? We do pre-revenue, but we want to talk to folks who are using it. So you might have a, a free product in a pilot stage. Mm -hmm. Well, let's find out who's using it, if it's in the school district, talk mm -hmm. to some teachers and see how it actually is going. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, I think any company who's going to get a seed stage investment has to get to a point where they have revenue to get to an A. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we know that as investors, but I think sometimes entrepreneurs think it's possible to raise without a product and then possible to raise an A without revenue. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that to be false. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Other thoughts? I mean, I'll jump in. When I, yeah. I started in the venture business 20 years ago, and it took $5 million to create a product, and the world has changed dramatically. It doesn't cost a lot to build a product, a minimum viable product that you can get out there and test. So part of understanding whether an entrepreneur has that sort of those execution chops and they are a GSD mm -hmm. entrepreneur is have they hustled, gotten something built, gotten out in front of customers, gotten it tested. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we will also invest sort of if they're committed pilots, you know, we like to see money changing hands in those pilots, but, um, you know, but, but Entrepreneurs can get a long way without a lot of cash mm -hmm. nowadays mm -hmm. in terms of at least yeah. getting something out there that they can test. It may not be the final product. There may be a lot more money that needs to go in to make it robust, to make it complete, to make it scalable. But you can get something done on, on a little. And, you know, the more scrappy mm -hmm. you can be as an entrepreneur, the farther you can get, the more impressed I am. Yep. Indeed. And I'd love to jump in with an example. Um, we had an entrepreneur who came to us, and when we first met him, he just seemed so early with his product. His basic premise was to try to make commuting in cities better, uh, specifically during commuter hours, starting with San Francisco. And you know, he came in, pitched us the idea. We liked the passion, but it was so early, and we basically said, OK, this is a little too early for us. Two weeks later, he shows up at our office, and he's like, I did it. I started driving a van, I leased one myself, and now I'm driving people, uh, picking people up around San Francisco. And I'm like, oh my God, the regulatory nightmare. But <laughs> I was still impressed. And it was amazing because he showed not only the passion, but that willingness to get things done immediately. And you know what? He started transacting money, showing real revenue and growth. Uh, this company that we were the first investor in is uh, called Chariot. You might have seen it around San Francisco. It's a crowdsourced commuter shuttle. And less than two years after our initial investment, they were bought, bought by Ford Motor Company to build out Ford's smart mobility line. So I think it shows the power of being scrappy, being tenacious. And even when you don't have the technical side all figured out, you can show that there's a willingness to pay. Um, and we think that entrepreneur is a great example of execution at work. You know, I, I asked you not to bring that one up <laughs> because uh, you know she 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 brought uh, she introduced us to the the founder of that company, and we passed. 
And uh, now I, I see a chariot van just about every single day. <laughs> and I'm constantly reminded that uh, we passed on a deal that was a nice exit after about two years. So, um, but you know, as a VC, you have to get over the ones that you missed. Um, um, we'll have other ones. Yes, I'm sure you will. <laughs> no, um, both of us. Yes, that's as right. Co-investors. That, that's true. That's true. You but, can you know, send those Brian, to us. Brian's going to miss out on, on Book Note. Uh, great. Well, why don't we shift gears a little bit? I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, sort of portfolio construction, and this is a, a big topic. This is something that you know Rick and I talk about a lot. You know, our advisors. We talk, get a lot of advice from our advisors. I think um, maybe we can demystify it a little bit for maybe the entrepreneurs in the room as well, because this gets to things like follow-on strategy. You know, it's important to know when you're talking to a venture investor, you know, do you reserve for follow-on or is it just a one and done uh, kind of investment? Um, you know, which can be good and bad. I mean, if they don't follow on, um, you know, then that tells you something about, you know, what the next round is gonna look like. If they do follow on, um, but end up not falling on into the next round, that could be a negative signal. So mm -hmm. these are things to be thinking about as, as an entrepreneur as you go out to fundraise. But maybe uh, get a couple of you guys talking about, you know, how do you think about portfolio construction uh, in terms of, you know, shots on goal versus, you know, going uh, sort of wide, you know, or deep, uh, you know, stake, are you stake driven? Uh, do you reserve for follow-on? You maybe uh, talk a little bit about that. You want to take that one? Yeah, I can start because this has really evolved. Um, it's evolved with both the landscape evolving as well as our fund strategy evolving. So recall that I said we spun out of New School's Venture Fund. And so when we were still part of that nonprofit, we had a very different strategy. Uh, number one, we weren't financially return driven. And so the goal was really about seeding the market, right? So we were making very small bets, 100,000, 200,000, kind of spreading those bets around. We made 50 investments, so lots of investments, and zero follow-on. So again, entrepreneurs knew, like, here's your kind of seed money to get you started. And our goal was, let's grow this ecosystem. Let's talk to other co-investors, other Series A investors that, you could, that can take you on the next round. Um, but that was really the goal. So we we're really just kind of sprinkling and kind of seeding the market. Um, as we moved to reach one, we became more opportunistic. Um, so still making small bets at the seed stage, but then really wanting to double down into our winners. So some, that means, you know, we reserve capital, but not everybody, like you were saying, not everyone we're gonna necessarily follow on on. It's really about, do they reach certain metrics and certain uh, milestones that we feel comfortable really doubling down and basically choosing our winners. And so that's kind of half of, that, half of our capital now is just going into um, doubling down into our winners from our seed. So less, less initial companies and then doubling down. Um, as we're moving forward, we're, be, we're coming, becoming more ownership driven, um, mm -hmm. just from a fund strategy perspective. And so we're actually making even fewer bets, taking a larger ownership stake from stage one, and then again, doing a double down. And that's partly driven by um, the fund economics that we're trying to achieve. And so part of it is also driven by your LPs, their expectations. Um, and so that's kind of driving our strategy forward. So I say now it's more a couple of seed deals and then identifying the winners and doubling down on those. And what's your, what's your typical reserve ratio when you look at a deal? Yeah, it's usually 50-50. So 50 for the initial check and then the other half. So one to one? One to one. Okay. Other thoughts, Tasha? Huh, we're one to one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say a very similar strategy in terms of doubling down on the winners. Um, you know, I will say, you know, just having been in the venture capital business for a long time, when you get to larger venture funds, you sort of are expected to participate pro rata. And as entrepreneurs, you should sort of think about this as a small fund. We do have a little bit of money to do follow-ons, but not a lot. And as a small fund, you tend to have less expectation of larger funds around the signaling effect of whether dollars come in or don't come in. Um, but that is something to, you know, to think about. I mean, sometimes as an investor, um, having, as an entrepreneur, having pockets around the table that can buy you a little more time if you need to hit those milestones is really critical. Um, and then other times, you know, you know, that signaling effect mm -hmm. is important. It's tough to do as a small fund, so we're being trying to be more strategic about where we place our follow-on bets, but mm -hmm. um, we're one for one. All right. Same. Same. So Same. boring. <laughs> <laughs> 10 to one, no. Yeah. I will say that on the portfolio construction, um, you know, there are some funds that are ownership stake driven. We're multiple of return driven, so, mm -hmm. um, so that's part of how we think about it. We don't think, oh, we need to, you know, own you know, 10% or 20% of the company, we really want to see the ability to make at least 10 times our money on any individual deal, ideally mm -hmm. with upside for more than that, um, because we are taking that early risk, and that's sort of a different mindset around how we look at opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so let, let's shift gears again, talk, talk a little bit about uh, what the mechanics look like at the early stage. You know, these days, 
uh, you know, before it was seed, <clears throat> and that was the first stage, but now there's a stage before seed called pre-seed. Who knew that there was a stage before seed, but there mm. actually is now called pre-seed. And I like to think of pre-seed as kind of a continuum of investment, right, where, you know, typically you have a founder raising on notes uh, over time, you know, until they get to the point where then they want to raise a price round. Um, so these days, as a founder, you know, you're typically raising on convertible note, you're raising uh, on a safe, or you're raising a priced round. I'd love to hear from maybe two or three of you on, you know, what, what does that typically look for, like for you? I know some, some firms like, you know, Manu Kumar at, at Canine Ventures uh, and, and others just won't do notes and they won't do safes. Um, I know we've got a bit of an allergy to safes at, at Better Ventures, but, mm. but we do do notes. Um, and others are much more flexible and sort of open to doing whatever. And I, I just, I'd be curious to hear your, your thoughts. You wanna? Yeah, sure, I can kick it off. We're um, open-minded, so I would say that the landscape, since we uh, invest in the pre-seed and seed stage, we typically write a, an initial check between 100 and 500K. We're open to convertible notes, safes, uh, price rounds. We're pretty open-minded. I would say the landscape we've seen has shifted much more heavily toward notes and safes, just given the fact that we are at the earlier stage. Um, and I would say that for entrepreneurs, just being careful around notes because they always warn you, but a lot of times when you have multiple notes with different caps, it gets really messy and it's hard to know your exact ownership percentage, which is why I think investors certainly prefer to have clarity around it through a price model. Um, that said, it's less expensive and entrepreneurs need to be conscientious of time and you wanna be scrappy and thoughtful about that. So we are open-minded. Yes, same for us. I mean, I would say 80% of the seed stage deals we do are going to come in on a safe note um, or a convertible note. And um, we're just flexible in, in kind of working with both. Um, I agree to the point of when you're doing a lot of notes, they kind of rack up and, and nobody really knows or nobody's paying attention to what does that mean when they convert? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem pr probably why you guys don't do safes or, mm -hmm. or, or convertible notes because you're trying to avoid that. Um, so one of the things that we, we try to do is just educate entrepreneurs, especially first-time entrepreneurs who might not know um, kind of the pros and cons of the choices that they're making. Mm -hmm. um, you know, safes are really easy to do. Um, anybody, mm -hmm. you don't need a lawyer, you can kind of just re download it, update, it's, I think it's like three things you can choose. Right. Um, <laughs> valuation cap, a discount, or no discount, and no valuation cap. The funny thing about safe yeah. though is when you do the drop down on valuation cap, uh, it starts at 10 million. Yeah. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Well, you gotta, you gotta pay up for that. <laughs> but besides that point, uh, I think that as a, as a CTH fund, you've gotta be flexible because you don't wanna miss deals. Right. Um, and and right. for that reason, we do both. Right, right. Any other thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, okay. we, I mean, obviously, we're open-minded, flexible. We do a lot of safes and convertible notes. We mm -hmm. would never do one without a cap and lower than mm -hmm. 10, typically. Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> you can write that in. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm curious your thoughts about, you know, innovation and disruption in the venture market, especially as it relates to focus, you know, investing in the kinds of companies that we're investing in, you know, mission-driven uh, companies. You know, I had a long talk with uh, someone um, just recently about, you know, the 10-year fund structure. Like, does that make sense for impact? You know, most of us are, you know, 10-year fund structures. I know you guys are set up a little bit different, um, you know, be, being uh, uh, structured as you are. Um, but, you know, typically, you know, you see the 10-year fund structure, uh, and then, of course, there's, you know, pressure, increasing pressure as the year, years go by for, for exits. Um, you know, I, I'd love to hear some thoughts on, you know, what, what's broken or what doesn't work about the VC model as it relates to mission-driven entrepreneurs, and, you know, what are you doing or what do you think needs to be done to, whether it's, you know, looking at evergreen fund structures, looking at alternative exit strategies, um, you know, just different approaches that um, are, are maybe, uh, you know, unconventional as it relates to the more traditional VC space. Yeah, I'd say for us, one of the things that we're really thinking about is the exit outlook for a lot of our companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so primarily right now, it's going to be M&A and extra, but it mainly be PE. So within mm -hmm. a tech, that's what we're seeing right, right. now um, versus an IPO route. But even normal tech is not seeing the IPO route. IPO route as much. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're thinking about what are some alternative exit exit um, strategies. And we actually just had one company, um, they're called Goldbook. They do um, technology for a special education market. 
And what they did is they got to you know, raise a small, only raise a seed round, got to profitability, became very successful, um, and they decided to do a management buyout. Right? And so basically they bought back their investors and became employee owned, which was a great story. It was you know, a decent return for us. The, the founders are now um, you know, completely own the company and they're still making a, a large impact. So we're thinking more about, is there other, other kind of exit opportunities like that mm -hmm. um, versus the traditional IPO and M&A uh, route? Right. And are, is REACH set up as a 10-year fund structure? We are set up 10-year. Yeah. How many extensions? <laughs> no extensions? Well, you, you can, but you haven't done that yet. Well, no, but you, you have extensions in place if you need them. If Okay, got it. So I'll jump in just because yep. we have a unique uh, setup, which is mm -hmm. single LP um, structure, but run exactly like any other fund. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is, well, one is benchmarking. Um, if, if we want to kind of see our performance. Um, two, we've grown. I mean, we've got 130 portfolio companies mm -hmm. uh, in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I think probably used to run more so of an angel investment kind of shop or a mm -hmm. family office shop. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you start bringing on uh, folks to invest, investment professionals, mm -hmm. and you have to manage this type of portfolio, mm -hmm. um, it was just best for us to actually set up a fund structure. Mm -hmm. um, bringing in partners and recruiting is a big part of mm -hmm. venture, right? We all know carry is, is an incentive for folks. Um, how do you have carry without a fund structure? So mm -hmm. um, for us, it was, even though it ran as an angel shop for a while, uh, probably 2013, um, the goal was, set it up as a fund, mm -hmm. um, raise a quote unquote, raise a fund one, although it's sole, yep. sole LP, right. um, and then have fund two and fund three after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I've, um, uh, of the previous venture funds I've been involved with, every single one of them has used every single one of the extension years and then yep. often still had and positions left in the portfolio. So yeah. I'm not sure the venture fund model works yeah. for the venture yeah. funds, but there does need to be a liquidity time frame for limited yep. partners. Um, one of the things that we've been thinking about but not done yet is for those companies that can be um, sort of efficient in capital raising and um, nice cash flowing business businesses, does it make sense to put in a revenue-based financing kind of a structure? Um, but you need to have investor alignment around that um, and you have to have the entrepreneur lined up. So we have not found that right opportunity yet, but I think um, with looking at alternative structures for liquidity as an industry is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just say that we think it's important to actually match a lot of the best practices from a venture capital model. And while there are certainly a lot of struggles, including liquidity problems and extensions being used, I do think that there's there should be rigor in place if from both a venture fund model as well from a, a startup model around expectations. And our expectation is that you do return liquidity to the fund and that we return that to investors. Mm. I, I guess one point on that is that we have a bunch of folks who've raised funds, including the U.S. Mm -hmm. Would you go out with a different model? Like, would you go out with a five-year or four-year model? A four- or five-year model? Yeah, like a shorter, a shorter or a longer. No, I'm thinking longer. I think yeah. each fund, we're going we're gonna to inch it out a couple of years yeah. until, we're, until we get to Evergreen <laughs> someday. I mean, I think this is a hard issue, though, because, yeah. I mean, as venture funds, and we're sort of market-rate venture funds, we are looked at and compared with... Mm -hmm other fund structures that are out there in the market. Yep. And so anything that you do that deviates from that yep. is a you know, little flag that goes up. And yep. sort of more little flags go up and then you know, becomes yep. more difficult to, you yep. know, to, to get that yeah. done. I, I mean, I, I agree that with the, the comment about rigor and track and carry and those kinds of things. Um, but I do wonder if we should just call a spade a spade and quit calling them 10-year funds and call them 14-year funds. <laughs> I did some research recently and was quite, well, not too surprised, but found out that the percentage of funds that are fully liquidated after 10 years, four, 4%, four percent, four percent of funds fully liquidated after 10 years. Once you go out to 14 years, you're still not even at half. You're at about 48, 45, 48% of funds. And that's just not, not just the impact space. That's, that's not just the impact, yeah, that's, so that's traditional. So this yeah. is the traditional space. Arguably, we're a bit more patient, you know, maybe a little bit more longer term a little bit pickier on our exits because we want to make sure they're mission aligned. But, um, you know, it, it's, uh, there's some give and take there um, with, with the I length of fund. My question would be, why should impact funds be the one leading the way on that? I, I, yeah, everybody should. And, mm -hmm. you know, impact already has enough barriers uh, sure. against it. I don't think yeah. we need to create another. Agreed, agreed. But, you know, we're innovative, so <laughs> people need to follow us. Um, Last question, and then I want to open it up for audience questions. Speak to the entrepreneurs in the room. 
do's and don'ts of fundraising. Do's and don'ts of fundraising. You're an entrepreneur, you're getting out there, you're going to pitch one of us, you know, what to do, what not to do. So what to do. Uh, know how much you're raising um, and why. And why. Yeah, <laughs> an amount, right? A, a number, not a range. A, a number. Like, not a range. I'm, I'm going out and we're raising a million, a million and a half, two million, and here's what we're going to do with it. Um, so that's one. Uh, I think having the team pulled together, uh, not we're going to raise and then go find the team, mm -hmm. but show up with the team mm -hmm. and maybe some hires that you've identified that when you raise, they will convert, mm -hmm. uh, but you've identified all the folks to make this thing kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, you spent time on your product. Um, you have something to show, to test with, the minimum viable product um, so that you can actually use it and see what real customers think of it. Mm -hmm. Um, those are all, I think, mandatory for a mm -hmm. seed round. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're pitching an impact fund, what is the impact? H how, does this, how does this play out, not only in the next year, but in the next five years? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of how is that piece of the impact attached to the vision? Mm -hmm. um, because as we all know, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the impact is the first thing to fall off. Well, why are you doing X? If you got rid of that, you can increase your margins by mm -hmm. X percent. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's those things that we're trying to look for of, of what we call core impact, mm -hmm. um, so that it, it actually cannot fall off because it's attached to the product. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I think if you have those four things, you're in a good place. I'd say do your homework and know who you're talking to, right? So come into, if you're gonna come talk to Reach, I love it when entrepreneurs are like, I know, I've looked at your portfolio, I know you guys specialize in ed tech, I know you guys specialize in seed stage, this is why I wanna partner with Reach specifically versus all the other ed tech funds, so really know who you're talking to, have done your homework about the fund and really kind of convince me why I am the fund that you want to work with. Mm. I would just add um, one of the don'ts is please don't fundraise for multiple rounds at the same time. We've seen this <laughs> quite a bit and it's surprising where an entrepreneur will come in and they'll be raising a seed and a series A or, you know, oh, I'm raising my series A in one month once I close this, but it might get pushed if this doesn't happen. And it creates this confusion for me that, you know, makes me feel like you don't have a real game plan in place. Um, so I would say this seems intuitive, but it's amazing how often this happens. I mean, I would just say just a couple of different, I'm very impressed when entrepreneurs can go from big vision down into the details and then come back up again. I think that's incredibly, um, it's incredibly powerful and it, it, it means that I know you're gonna be on top of where you're going and where you think you can bring this company, but also be on top of the details that matter in terms of getting there. Um, the other thing I would say just on the impact side, um, if I can articulate your impact story better than you can, that's not a good sign. Um, so I think sort of be, be crisp about it, just if there's evidence, share it. If there's not evidence, you know, then make the case why I should believe that the, the impact is there. Um, and, and that is something that, um, you know, we do see entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. you know, who come in not prepared to have that conversation, so. What about, what about cold emails? Will you answer cold emails? Yeah, so we, we answer all cold emails. We actually also have um, on our website, you can just click on a button and actually fill out an application. And so we're, we're responsive to everything coming in. It does help, though, if you have a referral, but we're, we're open to cold, cold inbound. But if well. you're going to send a cold email, Make it unique to the fund you're sending it to. Don't send me don't and Chantel me. and Brian. And don't send us the same one, because I can tell when I read it. So don't, don't, you're not an advocate for the carpet bombing you approach? You can send it cold. It just can't be a work? carpet bomb. What if, what if we, they CC everybody on the email? Oh, that's even better. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Try to be subtle if you're going to yeah. carpet bomb. I, I will say um, just one point for the cold email. Um, obviously, it helps when you have a referral, but we actually feel very strongly about the power of um, keeping our cold emails open. We have open submissions on AngelList. What we found is it's really helped diversify our uh, pool of founders. So for example, with our accelerator program, 76% of the founders have a woman or person of color on the founding team. We're really proud of that. And we think a big reason for that is because we accepted you know, entrepreneurs from everywhere and we didn't have to have, you know, oh, you have to go through my buddy Bob who's at the country club with Sue. I, I'm making that up because I'm not part of a country club, but the premise here is please be open and, you know, we want to hear from you. Yeah, I, I second that. Um, we have open submission. Um, send any email. You'll get a response. It just doesn't go to a black box. 
Um, you got to think, entrepreneurs are working so hard on their business. Um, they deserve a response of mm -hmm. some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's how we ended up with the same numbers. Uh, we're over 50 or 56% of our founders are either a woman or a person of color. Um, and a lot of folks just don't have those networks, and that's mm -hmm. okay because yep. they have great businesses. Yep. Great. Awesome. So we've got about a little over 15 minutes left. Want to make sure we uh, answer questions from the audience. I'm not sure if we've got microphones in the audience, but maybe just speak up. Yeah, right there in the front. Uh, hi, I have a question. What do you all think about equity crowdsourcing both from a credit and a free I can hear, I can hear. Uh, my question is, what do you all think about equity crowdsourcing, uh, both from an accredited and an unaccredited side. Uh, how does that impact your decisions if somebody's equity crowdsourced? Mm -hmm. anyone, anyone want to comment on equity crowdfunding? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in because uh, full disclosure, we're investors in AngelList, um, which does accredited investors uh, crowdfund funding. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's great. Uh, crowdfunding is great um, if you have some traction. Um, I don't think it's the place you go to start your fundraising. If you're trying to raise a million, million dollars, I would not start on AngelList. I think if you have 750 k lined up, then you can kind of close out the round on AngelList. Um, because the angels who are investing on the platform generally don't have a chance to talk to you. Um, they don't have a chance to ask their questions. And they're really investing based upon some other investor has vetted this deal. Um, so if you're going to go out for entrepreneurs in the room to raise try to get some initial cash in the door or commitments, and then use AngelList to finish out the round. Great. Other questions? Okay. We do have a microphone. Just raise your hand if you want to ask questions so everyone hears your important question. Hi. I think this session is called The Rise of Seed Funds, but I've read a couple things lately about a lot of seed funds moving up into Series A and there being less seed funds. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Talk a little, what was the last part of your question? Talk a little bit about the fall of seed funds, not a rise of seed funds. If there's a fall, funds, there's a fall of seed funds. Um, thoughts? I don't, I've, I've actually seen a lot of movement towards pre-seed. Um, so I think people actually, there's, there's both. There's people moving upstream, but there's also a lot of movement downstream. And I think you're also seeing a lot of the angel funds or the, or the micro funds kind of move into that seed stage. Um, I think what also is happening is that seed is becoming the new A, right? So I'm a seed stage investor, but I'm writing $500 million checks, right, into seed. Um, mm -hmm. So just the terminology is changing. Um, so what used to be seed, I think, is now more pre-seed. Um, so I think it's more of a terminology versus people actually moving out of the space. So. Yeah. I mean, I would say there's also a fund economic component to this, right? Because if you've got, it, you know, it's hard to make the economics of a small fund work. So as funds become successful, they will likely raise larger subsequent funds. Um, and if you're raising a larger, larger subsequent fund, your check sizes get bigger, and then you end up being maybe more suitable for companies that are raising larger rounds. Um, and so I think there, there tends to be some natural progression over time. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of you know, micro you know, VCs, there's a lot of seed capital out there now, um, which I think is a, you know, a great thing for entrepreneurs. Great. We've got a question in the front. Where's that mic? Should I go? Sorry, uh, quick question. You talked about the struggles sometimes with exiting. Sorry, right here. Um, just curious, are there secondary impact investors and do you have examples of where you've sold your positions to other impact investors and is there a need for, for more players in that space? I, have, I mean, I have not seen that yet. Um, it's interesting sort of in the main um, VC space you see that a lot. It's driven by the need for liquidity for limited partners in funds. Um, and I think the impact fund space is still relatively young. Um, and the investors in these funds are still, you know, they have this sort of expectation. They don't need to drive that liquidity. So um, I haven't seen that come up as much. I mean, I do think there's an interesting opportunity um, with private equity buyers to create liquidity for venture funds. Um, once companies get to a certain place and you're st starting to see more impact private equity funds. So I think that's, um, promising from a liquidity perspective. I don't know if others. Yeah, have I mean that's we've mainly seen it in private equity. So um, we were able to get secondary in one of our deals through um, Insight Venture Partners, who does a lot of education work. So I, they're not necessarily impact um, specifically, but do have a, like a lot of a large education focus. 
Um, so I do think more PE. And then I think you'll see some of like the, the Bain Capitals or maybe TBG can also provide some of that kind of secondary capital. Over here. Just shout. I'd like, I'd like to know your experiences of being approached by B corporations for seed funding. Yep. Have you seen them coming to you? Yep. What percentage of them actually get the money? Uh, so if you could talk about that, that yep. would be helpful. Yeah, I, I can jump in and say we've seen a lot of B Corps, and I would um, just you know kind of differentiate. There's B Corps, which is the certification by the nonprofit B Lab, and then there's the public benefit corporation model, which is when you're actually legally incorporated, for example, in the state of Delaware. Um, and we've seen a lot of startups in that space. So out of our first portfolio of 38, we had eight companies that were uh, B, uh, public benefit corporations. In fact, one of our startups was one of the first um, startups to be a, become a public benefit corporation in 2013 when Delaware passed that law. So we think it's great and a great model and it sets up expectations really well. But again, all of these are for-profit startups pursuing market rate returns. I think where it's really helped is when you have a uh, beneficiary for their product or service that's uh, lower moderate income and it really aligns incentives around the types of constituents that you're serving through your product. Um, so I think it's a great way to kind of communicate that to the external world that you're for-profit but for impact. Um, my question is regarding for an entrepreneur, when do you think he should approach uh, early stage fund, like months before he's actually ready for the money? Do you guys like to be updated? You know, here's where I am right now, I'll be ready in a few months from now, or should they go right when they are ready to receive the money? I, I would say today, right after this panel, is the right time to talk to us. Um, I, I think building relationships is a good thing. Obviously, you don't want to spam or you know be premature in your ad approaches, but certainly putting a face to a name never hurts. So if you want to talk after this, you all should. I think it's fine to do updates. What I will say is um, just make sure there's, uh, there's meat with those updates. So sometimes I get an update just checking in. It's like, that's not, not helpful. But um, if there's an update and you're saying, hey, we just closed this big contract, we just closed this big partnership, that's more helpful just as you start to reach different yep. milestones, I'm happy to be updated. Uh, I heard you mention seed and pre-seed. It seems like the definitions of startup and early stage are morphing. And this whole class of seed and pre-seed, can you give yep. some definition for the entrepreneurs in the room? as to what you consider the differentiator between seed and pre-seed? Sure, I'll hop in and say that, um, as someone pointed out, I think you, Chantel pointed out, so today's seed round was yesterday's Series A round. So seed rounds are, you know, priced seed rounds are two to three million, upwards of sometimes even four, even five million. And, uh, and then today's pre-seed rounds are sort of yesterday's seed rounds. So everything just kind of shifted up one. And part of that is because it's never been cheaper and less expensive to start a technology company because of you know, Amazon Web Services and um, you know, uh, software that's available uh, to use for free. Um, and so it's just, it, there's never been a better time to, to, an easier time to start a company. And uh, as a result, you know, th there's been sort of an institutionalization of seed. And so I think of pre-seed as that, that really early, you've got the team, you've got this sort of founding team, You've got an MVP, but you're kind of just getting started. And I still think there's even a round before pre-seed, which is really kind of friends and family, or, or you know, slash accelerator. So you raise like 100K from your friends and family, use that to get an MVP into the market, get a little bit of traction, then go raise a 500,000 to million dollar pre-seed round, try to get a fund involved, probably do that on a convertible note, and then use that to get about 12 months, maybe 18 months of runway to get some more traction, then go and raise a, a sort of proper priced seed round of anywhere from two to three million. That's typically what we see. That's not always the case if you're a multi-time entrepreneur. Sometimes you can come right out of the gates, you know, raise in a, a really big seed round and then go and then raise a series A. The other shift we're seeing is the multiple seed rounds. So now on average, companies are raising two to three seed rounds. So it used to be seed straight mm -hmm. to the A. It is now seed, 
Series C2, Series C3, um, which is which is fine. And that's not just in the impact space. That's kind of industry wide. Um, so now we're seeing entrepreneurs raise multiple, raise multiple seed rounds as well. And I encourage entrepreneurs to think about raising to milestones. Like, what are you? How much, are you raising enough to get to your next milestone? What is your next milestone? Um, so rather than think about my seed or my Series A, we want to have that conversation with you. But be, beware of beware of the bridge round. Don't ever call it a bridge round. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, at least, yeah. whenever we see bridge rounds, we we, we usually run away um, mm -hmm. because it, it's like a bridge to what. You know, it, it's an indication that, you know what, we didn't quite get as far as we thought, we're running out of money, we just need a little bit more money. Um, and it's a bit of a nuance, but if you're, you know, if you're raising subsequent rounds, even if you're still at the seed stage, so long as the next round is bigger than the previous round, then it doesn't look like a bridge round, it just looks like a next round. But if it's smaller than the previous round, then it looks like a bridge round, and that's a bit of a red flag. But if you haven't accomplished anything since your last round, that's it true. still looks like a bridge that's round, true. even if you raise more. Yeah. It's even yeah. It right, just, right. It, no matter what you call it. it. Just because time went by, that doesn't mean the valuation goes up. Like, you actually have to make progress. Uh, hi, uh, I'm from Brazil, and uh, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing if you have strategies to invest in entrepreneurs from emerging markets and what, that, what those strategies are, if you're looking at Brazil specifically. Anybody emerging markets? So for our fund, we, um, we invest only in companies that are uh, incorporated in the U.S., what we do tend to see is that many entrepreneurs will come to the U.S. and they want to use um, the U.S. as a jumping off point. And so we're open to that as long as they do incorporate um, as a U.S. entity. For us, when we think about urban problems, they're obviously universal, not just here in the U.S. where 81% of Americans live in cities, but certainly across the world where two-thirds of the world's population will be urbanized by 2050. Um, so it's important to us that when entrepreneurs grow and scale, that they do scale outside of the U.S. But I would say, for our strategy specifically, we're we're mostly North American focused for now. I had an emerging markets question too. Um, I represent Empowerment Works, and we have um, social innovation trainings and also an event called the Global Summit, where we like to use that as a platform for sourcing innovators and um, startups, impact startups. And so I'm wondering about your experience of how it might be best to um, to work with you, like rather than starting our own fund, allowing you to do what you do best and us more on the sourcing, um, just what your experience is working with events that are sourcing and providing a challenge to bring out those entrepreneurs and encourage mm -hmm. new ideas. Was there a question in there or just a uh, statement? <laughs> what, uh, How do we work? your experience with, the, with, um, with event platforms to, yeah. to identify um, sure. investment opportunities? Is that efficient for you? Mm -hmm. And how could you be approached? What would be a good way mm -hmm. yeah. to approach that for us? Any thoughts or examples of? I, I think it depends on how targeted the event is. So if it's sort of a sweet spot, I know it's going to hit like software companies in the area, in one or more of the areas that we're investing in, and I know there's a high likelihood, then that is an event I might come and attend. I, I would say it's hard to sort of commit the time, because time is sort of the most precious thing that we have. Um, and so I think the more targeted you can be and the more targeted the set of investors, um, the more effective those events can be. At least that would be sort of my two cents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the more sort of sweet spot and overlap you can hit, I think the more, um, the more people will be willing to come and spend their time, uh, you know, attend the event, you know, travel to it, if in the, you know, and, and really then I, listen to all the companies. I was in, in your challenge question, I think identifying an area where maybe we're having a difficult time sourcing, where mm -hmm. we're not seeing a lot of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, so I have seen challenges work in that case where we're not seeing a lot of activity, for example, in, I was going to say, like, we are now, but let's say early childhood, and we want to spur early childhood innovation. Like a challenge works great because then you identify entrepreneurs that maybe we didn't have access to before. So those type of challenges are really useful. Mm -hmm. I would also jump in and say we love events because it's a great way to source entrepreneurs. So again, if you're an entrepreneur, come talk to me. Um, but I would also just add um, I'm really mindful of the fact that there are predatory events out there. Not that that is yours, but there are some events that will charge entrepreneurs thousands of dollars to get access to an elite group of investors. And I think that is just morally wrong. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, don't do it. And we refuse to participate in events like that. Great. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Okay. Um, 
So make it a good you, one. Make it a good one. It's the last one. <laughs> yeah, I know. The pressure's on. You gave examples of when um, an entrepreneur comes to you a little too early. So they need to go out, uh, develop some more evidence that this is going to stick, has traction, et cetera. Can you give examples of when you tell an entrepreneur that um, they don't need you or they don't need you yet because they're already generating enough revenue? Idea here being, when is it not in the best interest of the entrepreneur to engage you? There is a lot of skepticism about, uh, or fear about being taken advantage of by seed stage investments. I'll jump in. Um, so I think a lot of these challenges happen to first time entrepreneurs uh, because you don't know, you, you started a company, it's going well, uh, you don't want to lose control of the company. Um, so one of the ways to do that is just look at when you're raising the first round, um, choose your investors wisely, right? I think we all do deals all day long or a couple times a year, and we have way more knowledge typically than an entrepreneur who's doing it for their first time. So there's, there's an unfair advantage mostly for VCs. Um, we try to ease that pain or ease that uh, situation by sharing some, of the inf sharing some of the things they should think about when, pr when pr uh, proposing kind of the seed stage deal. So that's one. Um, I think legal counsel is really important. Um, you should have legal um, to kind of give you some advice for what should you be doing, what should you be thinking about, how should you write the terms. And then I think the third, the third thing to do is once you raise the seed round, that's probably the first of many rounds. Um, so you've got to think not only about this round, but about the next three rounds. Um, and if you do it that way, you can set it up in a way that even by point A or series A, you're not going to lose control of the company. Series B, you won't lose control of the company. Now, when you get to series D and beyond, it gets pretty tricky. I think the other thing to think about, so there are times I've um, met with entrepreneurs, and maybe it's just not a venture business, right? So that could be the other consideration. Like, you look at, if you talk to them and you hear about their vision and what they're trying to build, it's like, oh, this is a lifestyle business, or this is a small business, mom and pop, you know, type of business. This is not necessarily venture business. And we can have that conversation and say, you know, do you, you know, what kind of business are you really trying to build? Do you really want venture investors? Because that means something like in terms of control and expectations. Or maybe you're happy just to run the business, get to profitability, bootstrap. So having those kind of conversations is important too. Great. Well, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, thank our panelists for uh, participating and sharing all your great insights and knowledge. Thank you, guys.